My name is Aniban Basu. Our company's name is Sage Policy Group Incorporated. We, along with architectural firm GWWO, were hired uh, to conduct an assessment of an issue that faces Baltimore County Public School high schools, and that is current and prospective overcrowding. Uh, and we've worked as a study team to come up with a set of scenarios that we're going to show you tonight. These scenarios very much reflect public input that we received heretofore. And I'll try to make the case that, in fact, public opinion is very much embodied within these scenarios. And this is an opportunity for you to further reshape these scenarios, these potential solutions to high school overcrowding in Baltimore County. And so I hope that you will engage us in that process. Some of you have already seen some of the scenarios outside. You took that opportunity. We know, obviously, there'll be another opportunity after I'm done with a roughly a 20-minute primer on what we've done and what we have left to do. Uh, you'll have another opportunity to go out there and uh, look at these various options and to tell the people who are standing outside your perspectives on these things, how you'd like to see these options altered, or if there's a particular scenario in w that you find particularly um, supportive of your objectives for your children, your community, so on and so forth. And so this is the BCPS High School Capacity Gallery Walk. We thank BCPS for hiring, of course. As I say, my name is Aniban Basu. Uh, and uh, I will walk us through some material today. Tonight's purpose, I want to learn how the high school capacity study has progressed. It's been a multi-month study. Uh, we have conducted many focus groups. In fact, we con conducted a focus group a couple of months ago in this very facility. We have now conducted, after tonight, six gallery walks, and we've also uh, put out two surveys to garner public opinion on the issue of high school capacity and the challenges thereof. We want to re review some draft scenarios summarizing solutions, proposed solutions, to address high school capacity issues. And we want you to complete, if you haven't yet, a second online survey to provide valuable input to our study team. The first survey, conducted a couple of months ago, garnered more than 3,300 responses. The second survey, and the community has been engaged with this process for quite some time, has already garnered more than 3,000 responses. If I'm not mistaken, there's some computers set up outside to help you answer that survey. Of course, you could do it from the comfort of your own home or office as well. And so, so that's what tonight's purpose is, why you are here. And presumably, it's because you're stakeholders in this community and this public school system. Over the next 10 years, this public school system faces a high school capacity shortfall of approximately 1,700 seats. Our company, along with, as I say, GWWO Architects, which, by the way, is a company that has much experience working with this school system, even prior to this current endeavor, have been tasked with studying current and prospective overcrowding, collecting community feedback on multiple occasions in multiple ways, as I say, focus groups, gallery walks, surveys, and ultimately providing recommendations to BCPS. Ultimately, we will be supplying in December a report uh, to the, the school board. And ultimately, at that point, they're the ones who will either run with our recommendations or they won't. In some sense, we hope they will because of maybe professional pride, but also because we very much believe that the scenarios we'll ultimately supply to the school board will reflect your wishes, your aspirations for this school system. But again, I'll make that case as I go through the material tonight. And I will go through a, a lot of material tonight, but I'll try to wrap it up within about, as I say, 20 minutes. So here's the issue. All of our high schools are listed there on this slide. These are 2027 projections. Enrollment is in orange. Capacity is in blue. When the orange line is lengthier than the blue line, that means that enrollment exceeds capacity. That's an overcrowding issue. Now, in this instance, we're defining capacity using state-rated capacity, if that's a question. The enrollment is based on projections, of course, 10 years hence. Uh, my company, as it turns out, actually handles the projections for the school system. We work with BCPS on an ongoing basis to deliver forecasts to this community. And so this is based on our forecasts. Um, you'll notice that there are some schools that are slated for significant overcrowding. Catonsville, right at the very top, you can see that. But also Perry Hall and Towson represent other prominent examples of schools that are set to be, if they're not already, very overcrowded by 2027. Hence, there has to be some intervention. Somebody has to do something so that that is not the outcome. 
And that's what this is about. What is the preferred intervention from the community's perspective? You'll notice also, however, that certain schools are slated to be under capacity. In other words, enrollment will fall below capacity. Take as an example Woodlawn at the very bottom there, where the blue line exceeds the orange line. Now, I've used this example many times. I'm sorry if you've heard me say it before. It's just such a very clean example. And so you can see immediately that one potential solution is that because of the adjacency of Catonsville and Woodlawn, if Catonsville has too many kids relative to capacity and Woodlawn doesn't have enough kids relative to capacity, <laughs> very simple, isn't it? Let's move some kids from Catonsville to Woodlawn, except that when we have proposed this to various stakeholders, including folks from Catonsville, they've said, we're not big fans of that. Actually, they've said it in a different way. Um, but they've said that, essentially. That's not an outcome with which we would be satisfied. In fact, we'd be very dissatisfied with that outcome. And you'll see that that kind of public input is very much built into each of these scenarios. I'll make that case in a moment. Um, now, I, I indicated the number 1,700 before, 1,700 um, seat shortfall, and that doesn't sound like a big deal. Indeed, that sounds like one new high school. What's the big deal here? Do we really need so much a process here for just 1,700 seat shortfall? Yes, we do. Why? Because this 1,700 is spread out neatly across the county, so it's not possible to simply create a single new campus and deal with the capacity issues. That's one. The second issue is that this study has broadened since its inception. At first, we were focused purely on capacity. That's what our contract asked us to do. But you, the community, said to us, we don't want you just to focus on capacity issues. It's not enough simply to provide kids. Some of our schools are in really bad shape, and we want you to point that out in the report too, and we want you to build that in the scenarios as well. Another point to make about that 1700 is that that 1700 presumes that you use all of the available seats available to kids, whether at Woodlawn, Milford Mill, or Randallstown as examples. But to the extent that the community says, we really don't want you to shuffle kids to those schools, it may be the case that at the end of the day, those schools will continue to be under capacity. In other words, enrollment will not rise up to meet capacity. And I'll show you this more granularly in just a moment. So tonight, um, I want to point out that we initially created seven scenarios using a combination of statistical analysis and feedback from focus groups. And then um, we had gallery walks where, and perhaps some of you were at those gallery walks where we showed seven different scenarios and people responded to those. They also answered surveys uh, regarding their preferences for the final outcomes to be recommended. Um, so we now have information from surveys, from prior gallery walks, and embodied within these scenarios are considerations of school condition, as I say, not simply capacity. Tonight, you'll have the opportunity to review now the three finalist scenarios in some sense, though that's not correct in some sense, too, because they're not three final scenarios. They are open for further adjustment. But we've gone from seven scenarios to three based on your input. And the scenarios all have some similarities to them, which is good news because that's sort of further evidence that your public input has mattered in shaping these scenarios. Um, but again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this in a moment. So one of the things we did was we conducted a survey, two surveys now, as it turns out. But we have results from the first already. Or, as I say, over 3,300 people responded to that initial survey. And I'm just going to run through some questions. Some of these questions may be difficult to interpret um, because they are outside of the context of the survey. And so I'll try to point that out. Question one, should BCPS use all seats at schools that have surplus capacity, even if it means redistricting students in significant numbers? Now, I've provided or we've provided with you, for you responses for the central area, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, and overall. I'm going to focus on the last bar, the overall, just for purposes of, you know, of, of trying to maximize the benefit of our time together. So the most prominent answer here is in light blue, is in light blue. So should BCPS use all seats at schools that have some surplus capacity, even if it means redistricting students in significant numbers? Uh, I'm sorry, the most significant answer is in this orange right here. 56.4% disfavor such an approach. In other words, the majority of stakeholders say, we're okay with surplus capacity. We're okay, and we're not okay with redistricting in many instances. 
And you'll see that theme throughout these survey responses. Redistricting is not a favored solution uh, for many of the stakeholders that have engaged in this process. Question two, which redistricting priority is the most important? Two leading answers here. First is this orange colored bar, 48.7%. What does that pertain to? Impact the fewest number of students. Further evidence that a lot of people don't like this notion of involuntarily moving kids from one school community to another. We'll talk about voluntary movements through magnet programs in just a moment, but involuntary movements very much disfavored. The second most common answer is this yellow bar here, 39.1%, reduce overcrowding. So if you're going to redistrict, A, don't do it, impact the fewest number of students, or don't do much of it, and B, if you're going to have to do it, it's simply because you want to reduce overcrowding, that you really do have an issue and you have no other option. Question three, should BCPS consider program placement? And by that is meant magnet program placement when considering strategies to address capacity issues. Bless you. Um, the most common answer here is, as it turns out, this light blue, neutral. Sorry, light blue is favor. We favor uh, that solution. So let me just read that again. Should BCPS consider program placement when considering strategies to address capacity issues? Light blue, yeah, consider program placement. This is about magnet program siting. And so the notion is that A, a lot of stakeholders who have engaged this process like the idea of magnet programs, they like the idea of specialized curriculum, and they're okay if their kids and their families choose to voluntarily leave their school community to attend a magnet program elsewhere. And if that's a way to balance enrollment with capacity, that's fine with folks. One of the issues, other issues that um, was pointed out uh, in terms of magnet programs is there's a very strong feeling in much of the community that there's inequitable access to magnet programs. Of course, we understand that one of the defining elements of Baltimore County is our beltway. We also understand that that beltway tends to be very crowded almost all the time, but certainly in the mornings and the late afternoons. And that for some kids, they may very much want to go to a particular magnet program, but they are forestalled from doing that, prevented from doing that, just because of traffic logistics in the morning and in the afternoon. And that produces, therefore, inequitable access. access only, equitable access only theoretically, but not in actuality. So we'll discuss this issue more, but the point of this is, yeah, magnet programs are a potential solution, and we like the notion of more equitable access to them. Question four, when considering program placement, which priority is the most important? Again, we're talking about magnet programs. Most prominent answer is basically a two-way tie between this peach colored bar, this, this colored bar, 37.7%, that's expanding program availability, and then this blue colored bar, 37.4%, which is equitable access to programs. So, a, we want more programs, more magnet programs, a significant chunk of people say. Second, we want more equitable access to programs. And in some sense, they're two sides of the same coin. Question five, which priority is the most important when planning capital projects? And we'll talk about proposed capital spending in a moment here. Um, most prominent answer here, at least when we look at the overall answer, is this light blue here. What's the most important uh, aspect of you know, planning capital projects? Hey capacity relief for overcrowded schools. And in our focus groups, a lot of people associate overcrowding not just with an inability to deliver solid instructional um, content, because, for instance, you know, there can be very large student-to-teacher ratios or whatever it happens to be, but public safety issues came up as well. That Schools with more kids often can generate more public safety issues as well, more public safety challenges. So capacity relief for overcrowded schools, very prominent answer. The other one, um, the yellow, minimize the need for redistricting. And many people said to us, look, we might be cheap about many things. We shop at Amazon, but, but we don't want to be cheap when it comes to our kids. We don't want our kids to go to overcrowded schools, and if we have to pay more for that, we're willing to do that. Um, and, and, and again, you know, one of the other aspects of that is 
and we don't want to have to move our kids to get them to a less crowded school. We want, you to, we want them to be in their school community, and we want you to deal with the overcrowding issues at that school community, not simply shuffle them around. Question six, what do you view as the largest enrollment a high school can maintain and still supply a high quality educational experience? This is supremely interesting. Um, the most pr uh, prominent answer is this light green color, 39.6%. That corresponds to 1,400 students or lower. 1,400 students or lower. The second most prominent answer is this blue color right here. That corresponds to 1,000 students or fewer. So if you add up these proportions, um, you would see about 60%, three and five, favor school, a maximum school size of 1,400. And within that group, many are less than that. People don't want large schools. A question came up in a previous gallery walk, well, why in your scenarios haven't you put in a program that creates a lot of new schools that are smaller in number? How, why don't you do that? And there's a couple of answers to that, but one is that would cost a lot of money you need a lot of land. These end up spending a lot of money on land as opposed to facilities. And you could do that, and you would not address any condition issues at existing schools as a result, because the money would be deflected toward those new schools. So nothing at Delaney or Lansdowne or other schools that we know are rated quite lowly in terms of school conditions presently. Something to think about. We'll talk more about this in a moment. Question seven. What is the maximum amount you would support BCPS spending on meeting its high school capacity challenges? Most prominent answer is in dark blue, about $600 million. But the point here is that people would be willing to spend a lot of money. That's the point. You could frame this question differently. I mean, we could have put a, uh, a potential response, about a billion dollars or two billion dollars. People would have answered that too. I mean, they would have. The point is um, a lot. Now you have to be practical in some sense, don't we? Because there's a finite amount of money. The state would be a partner in financing this. Well, the state has its issues. I think you'd agree, Medicaid or whatever it happens to be, pension. We don't know what the federal government's finances are going to look like in 2027. But Medicaid, Medicare is set to go insolvent in 2028. So it has to be something that is at least theoretically affordable. So we put $600 million as the, the highest response possibility. Another 19% said oh, about $500 million. 21.3% said about $400 million, but you add up those three boxes there, you get 70% roughly who say um, spend at least $400 million. All the scenarios you'll see tonight have a price tag of around $600 million. It was another way in which we respected the community's wishes. The community said, yeah, $600 million, a lot of people at least said, yeah, that's okay. And that's exactly the price tag you'll see associated with a lot of these scenarios. In fact, all of them. Question eight, the best way to deal with capacity issues is by, most prominent answer here is in light blue, a combination of other tactics or a combination of these and other tactics. So if it's magnet programs, it's new construction, it's additions to certain schools, so on and so forth, combination. Second most prominent answer here is in a light gray, um, and that's construction of new schools. Third most prominent answer is this light peach color, 13.7%, and that's additions to existing schools. So a couple of themes here that emerge from this. People are willing to spend money. They want us to have significant capital spending on the high schools in this system. And three, and this is related to that, they don't want redistricting. Question nine. Should BCPS select the least expensive option for dealing with high school capacity issues? The least expensive options. Should we favor the least expensive options? Most um, common answer is this, let's call this brown, burnt umbra, whatever this color is. Three and four responded this. Um, disfavor. So in other words, people are saying, should we select the least expensive option? No, don't select the least expensive option, because we know what the least expensive option buys us. It buys us fewer capital projects and more redistricting. And that's not what we want. That's what the survey said, at least that's my interpretation of them. And again, hopefully you'll see that kind of thought, that kind of thinking in the scenarios, and I'll talk about the scenarios right now. Three scenarios, you're aware of this, some of you, obviously, I mentioned those three scenarios, but you may have seen them earlier, lined up neatly, linearly, A, B, and C. 
So let me take a step back and let me walk through these charts and how to interpret them, because there's quite a bit of information here on each chart. But once we do one, the next two will be quite easy. So this is the before picture. This is the before picture. This is the situation absent any intervention by the year 2027. So you see the map of Baltimore County here. These dark brown shaded areas, and you can see these are defined by schools like Catonsville and Towson and so on and so forth, schools we've mentioned, are associated with school areas that are over capacity. They're overcrowded schools in that area. You can never have too many kids. We love kids, but there are too many kids relative to the capacity in those areas. Absence intervention. These light brown areas, there's roughly speaking, by 2027, based on projections, an equilibrium between capacity enrollment. No real issues there. This light blue, which is associated with high schools like Woodlawn, Milford Mill, and Randallstown, right here, these are school zones in which capacity exceeds enrollment. So we've talked about this before. Canesville is associated with overcrowding, Woodlawn with undercrowding. This is the after picture, the result of this intervention, which I'll talk about in a moment. Notice the dark brown shaded areas are gone. No more overcrowding. Notice when you look at, if you can see it, which you probably can't, but if you look at each school community here, there's a nice balance between capacity and enrollment. That's the goal. There is some light blue here, however. Again, this same area uh, uh, denoted by Woodlawn, Milford Mill, Randallstown. What does this mean? It means that we have not pushed students into that capacity. Why did we not do that? Because the community told us, don't do that. Which means, ultimately, that we have to add more than 1,700 seats to solve the overcrowding issue, which you'll see in each scenario. OK. Now, we'll get to this map in a moment, right in the middle. But let me talk about some summary statistics here. So here are your capital projects right here, proposed capital projects under this scenario. Three additions that increase capacity. Three replacement schools, and you can see the uh, accompanying symbol to all of this. This sort of looks like a, a man on a horse or an alligator. That looks like a schoolhouse. This is three replacement schools, three new schools proposed under this scenario. Three additions proposed under this, under this scenario. Uh, this is just improving conditions at a school. No augmentation of capacity, but this, that symbol in that color. And this symbol right here in blue is addition plus renovation. Those are your various flavors of capital projects. If you add this up, three capital projects plus three capital projects plus two plus two, you get 10, 10 capital projects. 10 capital projects that under this scenario will add 2,950 total seats. How many do we need to add? Theoretically, 1,700. But because we're not using this capacity here, we have to add more than that to make sure that every scholar has a seat, 2,950. The cost, $590 million. That's the price tag, estimated. Now, you'll notice also, perhaps, that of this 2950, 652 of these seats are magnet seats that are added. So we're adding a combination of magnet seats and non-magnet seats, but the bulk of them, roughly four and five, um, are non-magnet seats. Here's a big number, two to consider. 1987, it was a fine year. But this is the number that pertains to the number of students relocating. Number of students relocating. Some of them relocating voluntarily. 652 total magnet seats added. So that's part of that population could be just kids. They're moving, they're relocating, but they're doing it because they want to or their families want to. But that means that roughly 1,300 kids are being redistricted. That brings me to this map. You see this symbol. Um, right here, it's a very common symbol. That common symbol means no action, no action. No new school, no, uh, no redistricting, nothing. Now notice that one of the places in which you see this symbol of no action is Woodlawn. 
The way you would get more kids through redistricting, a boundary change to Woodlawn, is you would expand the Woodlawn boundary to eat up more of Catonsville. That's how you do it. But what we're saying right here is that's not going to happen. We're not proposing that. No action at Woodlawn. It means that there is no boundary shift process that would take kids from Catonsville to Woodlawn. Why is that? Because the community said they didn't want that outcome. Now, a lot of you are interested in the capital project, so let's talk about those. So under this scenario, and there's a lot of symbols here, uh, but under this scenario, this, this means multiple actions, this kind of hybrid symbols. So what this is saying here is that you would have a replacement school at Towson. You'd have a replacement school here at Lock Raven. You'd have a re uh, replacement school at Western School of Technology. That's your three new schools under this scenario under this scenario. You would also have investment in conditions at Delaney and at Lansdowne, which as people have pointed out, are among the schools in the worst condition. At, is that a question? Good, good. It's taken, well taken. Okay, so let me show you now scenario B. So scenario B, Again, you know, summary statistics here. Here you have five replacement schools, five. And in this scenario, Delaney gets a new school. Do you have something to say about that? No, nothing, huh? Okay, interesting. So five schools. So here, Delaney, Lock Raven, and Towson, new schools. So five new schools under this scenario. Western School of Technology, Lansdowne, and three schools in the central part of the county. In a recent gallery walk, I, look, I, I, I screwed it up. I said the words, in this scenario, Central is getting a lot of love. And a person from the Delaney contingent there stood up and protested that language because I think what she heard me saying was, too much love. That's not what I intended to say. A lot of love. Love is good. It's not for me to determine or the study team to determine which of these scenarios is preferable or what's too much love or enough love or not enough love. We are agnostic across all of these scenarios or any other conceivable alteration of these scenarios. Your opinion is the only one that matters. And your opinion, you'll have a chance to provide your opinion through survey and to people standing outside just waiting to listen to what you have to say and write it down. Yes, after I'm done with my presentation. Okay? And then, um, so, I mean, we can go through this, but there's scenario C. Seven capital projects, $605 million. So you can see that each of the scenarios, if I go back to B, has a price tag of around $600 million. Uh, scenario C is unique in a number of ways, in particular because no magnet seats are added. So any of this movement, students relocating, is purely involuntary. And you know, from this, you can infer certain things. So you, know, you, you have a situation here down in the southwest where Catonsville would be subject to this, these, these lines right here in green. Rather than our infer things, can we ask questions right now about what those So um, I'll talk about the symbols. I'll talk about the symbols. It's a, it's a, you will have your chance to ask questions. And I just said that. Once I'm done, I'll let you ask questions. But you have chosen to ask a question now. And so if I, I having said I'll answer it afterwards, will answer it afterwards. But I want to be clear about something. These symbols right here, these green symbols right here, mean there is a boundary change process afoot. Now, boundary change is a separate political process. Very difficult for the study team to predict how that political process works out. However, you can infer certain things from the chart. So here, as I say, in the Southwest, you have boundary change processes at Catonsville and Western School of Technology and a new school proposed at Lansdowne with also a boundary change process. If you look here, I mean, you can't see it necessarily, but enrollment at Catonsville goes way down from the before picture to the after picture. Where did those kids go? You know a couple of things. They didn't go to Woodlawn. 
because Woodlawn is not part of boundary change process. Hence, if the kids from Canesville go anywhere, it must be to the east. And that's the way you can read this, interpret this, and so on and so forth. I know also you can make sure the numbers add up. Now, if you're going to have, let's say, for argument's sake, 500 kids moving from Catonsville to handle that overcapacity issue, that you better have room for them at Western and or Lansdowne. One key thing to note about the boundary change processes, under no circumstances did we assume that there would be any student who would be asked to move more than one zone. So any move that a student would make under a boundary change or redistricting process would be a maximum of one zone movement. That would, of course, allow for a movement from Catonsville to the east, but you couldn't, you would, we would move kids from Sparrows Point, for instance, to Delaney or whatever. No, that's not conceivable. It's not something that we've built into the model. And with that, I am done. Um, I will stand up here and take whatever questions you have of me. Happy to do that. Yes, absolutely. Madam, you had a question? Okay, sure, absolutely. And of course, you'll see the same board out there. Um, you'll see the same board out there. So just to review scenario B here. Three projects add to existing schools. Three, and so this is where you see this symbol. You can see one here at Pikesville, for instance. Quite a beautiful school, as it turns out. Um, you, you, um, you can see one at Carver, as it turns out, under this scenario. Would the Carver one add only magnet seats, or would it also add zone seats to perhaps leave overcrowding at It's it's not clear. Um, it could probably work. It could probably work either way. Uh, our preference is that you would add to the magnet capacity there. This scenario actually has magnet seats added. Because if you add magnets there and get kids to move there, one, I think a lot of people like the notion of pure magnets. Uh, we've heard from a lot of people who say, don't take pure magnets, and we have three in our system, as it turns out, uh, Western School of Technology, uh, Eastern, uh, and Carver. And don't, the notion of a hybrid school is anathema to certain people. Um, but you could, within that scenario, come up with different scenarios. You could turn Carver into a mixed school, a zone school, plus a magnet. And you could conceivably move kids to that capacity under either scenario. Yes? How are you coming up with your magnet schools versus your four magnet schools? Is that It's a great question, sir. So his question is you haven't put on this chart where the magnet seats are going to be added. It's a very good point. It'll be in the final report. There are a lot of details that are not here. Because otherwise, the chart would be completely difficult to interpret. Yeah. Not gospel. Not go you, you use the word gospel, not gospel. Perfectly susceptible. Gospel is not subject to adjustment. This is. Not gospel. But what we need from you is this. Where do you think the magnet seats ought to be added? Which programs do you think would be appealing? Which programs do you think should be moved out? This woman has told me through this process at least 18 times that she wants to see the law and public policy program moved out of Towson High School. OK. So um, I've heard it. Uh, you need to tell us that. We want to know. We Of course, it's based on data. So we're talking about where we're adding seats right here. I mean, we're talking about expanding, for instance, the magnet program at Carver as an example. All I'm saying is that you could come up with a scenario in which, and this is not it necessarily, but a scenario in which instead of adding magnet seats at Carver, you make it a quasi-zone school and magnet school. That's what I'm saying. But ultimately, the numbers add up. But I, we want to know what you think. Tell us where the magnet program should be. Obviously, you're going to tend to put magnet programs in schools that otherwise would be under capacity. We're trying to get voluntary movement to schools that are under capacity or have capacity available. Yes. Us 
Oh, no, no, it's exactly the opposite of what I just said. What I just said is that the notion of adding magnet programs, you would tend to add them in the undercrowded schools or schools that have capacity. You're trying to drive people away from crowded situations to undercrowded situations. Magnet, Woodlawn already has magnets. Yeah. You could. You, the question is, could you add more magnetics at Woodlawn? Here's our concern, is that we could add magnet capacity at Woodlawn and people would not go in significant numbers. That, you know, in some sense, we had to understand what people were saying about their perceptions of various school communities. And it's not obvious to us, based on experience, based on what other people have said, that you would get the kind of level of movement that you would want to really deal with the capacity issue. And the same might be true for Milford Mill and Randallstown. By the way, people told us repeatedly from those communities, Milford Mill and Randallstown, we have superstar principles, you know, so on and so forth, great things are happening. But reputational effects or negative reputational effects can linger. And so that's part of this. Now look, it's already 36 past. You need to be talking to them. They will answer your questions. Let me take two more questions. This gentleman in green has had his hand up for quite some time. Let me go to you. In the final report. Yes. It, 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 you're right. There are certain details left out that would have to be in a final report. We wanted this to be interpretable. His point is there are certain data elements that are not here. I don't disagree with you. If they were here, this would be completely illegible. It's a fair point. The, his point is the survey, answering the survey can be constraining in terms of the answers. However, you are unconstrained in terms of talking to them out there, and they will take everything you have to say down. And that's what I'd urge you to do. One more question here. I'll, uh, two more questions. Yes, madam. Uh, I have two general questions. Please. Yes. Phenomenal question. So the question is, what about this operationally? We're consultants. We're analysts. We will supply recommendations. More than one scenario, by the way. We're not going to supply one set of recommendations to the school board. We'll supply to them at least three different scenarios, and not necessarily these, um, and explanations in terms of what they mean, where the magnesies would be added, so on and so forth. would be in that report, probably quite voluminous. But your question is, when would the actions be taken, let's say on the capital projects or the boundary change processes, so on and so forth? Um, that is the, the determination of the school board. And you know, one of the issues here is how much money will the state contribute to this process? My fear is that the state may hold back a significant amount of funds. Why? because they will be able to, at least in certain instances, be able to point to the county and say, you are not using available capacity. Why are you not doing that? You're asking for funds to expand capacity, and yet you are choosing not to use existing capacity. And you're expecting taxpayers from Montgomery County and Kent County and Worcester County and Washington County and so on and so forth to pay for that. Why is that? And so that's a wild card. That's a political outcome. Boundary change processes are also political outcomes. Now, I would love to be able to tell you that all this would be done by 2027. I'm a skeptic. I don't think so. But again, these are political outcomes. I can't perfectly predict the state of the economy, so on and so forth. Um, the state of politics in Annapolis or in Towson. Um, but ultimately, a program like this has got to be completed. Why? Because there is a capacity shortfall. 
in Baltimore County Public Schools, so it, it cannot wait indefinitely. And two, there are some schools that are in really bad shape, and they need some love, whether it's on the scenario A, B, or C. And so the school system has to do something, but stakeholders here tonight who have voice have that same voice to use with the school board and the county council and Annapolis and so on and so forth, and I would urge you to do that because I think there's a lot of good things that could come out of this process. One more question, Madame, and I remember you from the focus group, a focus group. Thank you for being here. I, would, I honestly, I do not, not. I have to tell you, her question is, what is the, this, under scenario A, Delaney is proposed for only um, a renovation. No, BCPS, so her question is, you know, there were already proposals on the table at both Lansdowne and Delaney for renovation projects, and the community rejected them. And by the way, I remember you for your encyclopedic knowledge of capital spending in Baltimore County Public Schools. I mean, she can tell you which school got 28 million in what year and so on and so forth, so phenomenal. But um, no, BCPS didn't instruct us in any way. When the project was broadened to include conditions, we knew as a study team that we could not have any scenarios that didn't deal with Lansdowne and Delaney in some fashion. But, but, it is the case that we want it to be somewhat practical, that there is scarcity, there are constraints financially, and that ultimately under one scenario here, and you can tell us out there, you can say to folks, please do not present scenario A to the school board because it's already been rejected, and that's fine. But what we have here is a scenario in which we have compromised. And you may find it to be a very unsatisfactory compromise. But at the end of the day, even if we put a new school in for Delaney and Lansdowne for every scenario, there is no guarantee that that school board is going to do that. They might ultimately choose to do a renovation, or maybe even less than that. Those are political outcomes. So no one told us to do that. It is a compromise. A lot of this is a compromise. And feel free to tell people out there, on survey, wherever. You're an incredible advocate, of course. Uh, tell them that you reject this out of hand. This is not good enough. We accept that. Uh, listen, um, we have 16 minutes. So maybe one more question. You're all, by the way, free to go. You don't have to see this drama in here. If you want to go out there and talk to people, I urge you to do that. Because notice, I'm not taking any notes. So sir, go ahead. Yeah, it's a great question. So his question is, look, all of these scenarios have a budget or price tag around $600 million. Did you come up with any scenarios where you're unconstrained, where you said, have at it, billion dollars, 1.2 billion, what would that buy us? What would the high schools look like if that was the scenario? We have not done that. And I'll tell you why we haven't done it. It's because when I show these numbers to folks at the county, not to Baltimore County Public Schools, Baltimore County, they're not that happy with these numbers, as they are. And so again, and there's also the issue of timing, right? I mean, one of the things you want to do is, you know, you, you, you want to give guidance. And if you say, rebuild 24 high schools, that's not guidance either. It's meaningless, in fact, because that's not going to happen. And so, yes, it's a constrained exercise. I think it's right to be constrained because the fact of the matter is finances are constrained. But that answers your question. I, sincerely, maybe not to your satisfaction, but sincerely. That's it for me. Thank you very much. I'll be standing up here for any other questions, but it's been a privilege. Thank you.